Today we're going to look at the force on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. In a sense, we've already studied the force on a current carrying wire in a B field. Because we were just talking about if we have charges, say positive charges, and we send them into a magnetic field. So here we've got a north pole and we've got a south pole. And of course, there'd be a magnetic field coming across from the north pole to the south pole. That's the direction of our B field. And we said we could use our hand rule to figure out what the direction of the force on that charge would be. So we point our fingers in the direction of the velocity. We point our palm in the direction of the magnetic field. So our palm should be facing this south magnet over here. And because it's positive charge, we use our right hand. That will make our thumb point in this direction. That would be the direction of the force. So there'd be an upward force on our positive charge. Now of course a current is just a whole bunch of positive charges moving along. So we'd have lots of positive charges moving in that current carrying wire. Now of course the positive charges don't really move. It's really the electrons moving in the opposite direction. But for practical purposes it's perfectly valid to imagine positive charges flowing in the direction opposite to that that the electrons flow. And our force is going to be exactly the same. We're going to use exactly the same hand rule and we'll get an upward force on the wire. I'm about to show you a clip. It's from James Dan's YouTube channel where he's showing the deflection of a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. He has this humongous magnet here. There's the north end, there's the south end. So we're going to get a magnetic field going up this way. The red here is the positive side of the battery. Here's the negative side of the battery. So our current is going to go from positive to negative. And what I'd like you to do now before I show you the clip is predict what direction that wire is going to deflect once the clips here are connected and the current flows through the wire. So pause your video, make your prediction, and then we'll see what happens. So hopefully you made the right prediction. Now using the hand rule that I usually use, that would mean you've got your fingers pointing in the direction of the current. You get your hand orientated, it's got to be your right hand, such that the magnetic field is pointing upwards with the palm. And if you do that, then your thumb will point into the page with the force. Now there is another very common hand rule convention, and in that hand rule, you would point your thumb in the direction of the current. You get the fingers of your right hand going upwards with the B field and then your palm, which in this case would point into the page, would be in the direction of the force. But using either hand rule, your force points into the page. This force on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field, it's often called the motor effect because it's responsible for making electric motors turn around. And we're not responsible for learning about electric motors, so I'm not going to do any details here, but let's suppose we just have a single loop of wire, rectangular loop of wire, like so. And we're going to put a current through it. And we put our loop of wire into a magnetic field. So we'll have a, say, the north end of a magnet here and the south end of a magnet here. And we'll have a magnetic field, of course, coming across the loop, like so. That would be our B field. So now if I apply my hand rule, I'll find this segment from here to here experiences a downwards force. And this segment from here to here experiences an upwards force. And at least right now, there's no force on this segment or this segment because those segments are parallel to the magnetic field. So we get a rotating force there, causing that coil to turn. Now to keep it turning, we have to use some brushes and a split ring commutator. Otherwise, it'll just rotate to a vertical position and stop. But for now, I just want you to know that the force on a current carrying wire is responsible for making electric motors turn. Here's an animation of an electric motor. They're quite easy to build, and there's lots of interesting designs for electric motors that you could build yourself on the internet if you're so interested. 
It's useful to draw a magnetic field line diagram to understand this force on a current carrying wire. So let's imagine we've got a north pole and a south pole. North, south. And of course the field lines are going to come more or less straight across from north to south. Now we're going to have to combine that magnetic field with the magnetic field of a current carrying wire. So let's imagine our current carrying wire with the current coming out of the page. Then of course our field lines are going to have to circle in a counterclockwise manner using our right hand rule. So our problem becomes how do we combine those two field line patterns together into one field line pattern? So I'll draw one field line for that current carrying wire, like so. Points in a counterclockwise direction. And what happens with field lines is, if they're in the same direction, they can get quite close together, indicating a strong field. But if you have field lines in opposite directions, the fields are effectively going to cancel. That means you have a weak field in between. That means you need large spacing between the field lines. So what effectively happens? is that the field line will kind of go along like so, such that the field lines are in the same direction on this side of the wire. And it's only on the other side of the wire that they're in the opposite direction, here and here, and therefore we need a large spacing between those lines. So we're going to get a pattern that looks well, something like this. And where you have the bunching of the field lines, that leads to an upward force away from those bunched up field lines. You can kind of think of this as like a stretched material producing an upward force. And that agrees with our hand rule. We'd have our fingers coming out of the page with the current. Our palm would face to the left with the magnetic field. And that means our thumb would point upwards in the direction of the force. So if we put a current carrying wire through our magnetic field here, we might ask the question, how big will the force on that wire be? What parameters could we change in order to make that force bigger? So if I asked you, how could I set up this arrangement so I get a bigger force on the wire, you'd probably tell me, well, I could increase the force by increasing the magnetic field. I put some bigger magnets there. Or I could put the magnets closer together. Second thing I could do is, I could increase the current through the wire. If I have a bigger current, I should get a bigger force on the wire. And some of you clever people might say, well, I could use wider magnets. That is to say, this length, length of the wire here that's inside the magnetic field, it's not very big right now. But if I had wider magnets here, I'd have a larger length of the wire inside the magnetic field, and I'd get a bigger force. So there's three basic parameters we could change to get a bigger force. And it turns out they're all directly proportional relationships. So the force will be proportional to that product, ILB. And if we use SI units, then our proportionality constant is just 1. So our force in newtons will actually be equal to the current in amps times the length of the wire inside the magnetic field in meters times the magnetic field in teslas. But there's one other thing that we have to consider. And that's that here our current carrying wire is perpendicular to the magnetic field. But what if it weren't perpendicular to the magnetic field? Well, of course, we're going to have to make a modification. It's a simple modification. Some of you can probably already guess it. I'm going to do it in just a moment. But for right now, I just want to indicate that this equation only applies if the direction of the B field is perpendicular to the direction of the current. Now if we have the situation where our magnetic field is not perpendicular to the direction that our current flows in, then we end up with smaller forces. So what I'm going to do here is draw the magnetic field, but not in the field line representation, but as a vector. So there's my magnetic field vector. And then I want to draw another vector, really just indicating a direction here. This is the direction of the current. 
If I do that, then I can break this magnetic field vector up into two components. One component I'll call B parallel, because it's parallel to the direction of the current. And one component I'm going to call B perpendicular, because it's perpendicular to the current. And what's crucial to realize is that only B perpendicular contributes to the magnetic force. The parallel component of the magnetic field causes no force. So a more general version of our force equation would be simply I times L times B perpendicular. But of course B perpendicular, that's opposite to the angle between the two vectors. So B perpendicular here would be equal to the length of this vector, the magnitude of the magnetic field, times the sine of that angle theta, because B perpendicular is opposite to that angle theta. So now we have a more general version for the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. Now our hand rule for the direction of the force still works even if I and B are not perpendicular. So here's my right hand. Fingers, thumb, and I've got the palm coming out of the page. So the fingers point in the direction of the current, B is in the direction of the palm, and the force is in the direction of the thumb. But what's kind of essential to establish here is that there is a plane formed between I and B. So if I curl my fingers from I to B, I create a plane. That would be a plane kind of going into the page like so. And the force vector is always perpendicular to that plane. So if we want to talk about a situation where I and B are not perpendicular, well, we could simply start our I vector in this direction with the fingers somewhat curled. And you just curl your fingers down until you're in the direction of the palm. The force, though, is still in the same direction. So I and B really just establish a plane, and the force is always perpendicular to that plane. Now, if you're more accustomed to the other hand rule, then, well, here's the fingers, the thumb, and we'd have the palm coming out of the page. But this time we point our thumb in the direction of the current, and our fingers point in the direction of the B field. And now we can rotate our thumb towards B. So that gives us a plane, and the plane would be the plane of the screen right now. Perpendicular to that plane would be the direction of the force. So if the angle between I and B were less than 90 degrees, we could just start our thumb closer to the B field. But once again, we rotate our thumb towards B, and the forces are still perpendicular to that plane that's formed. So in general, we can write that the force is always perpendicular to the plane formed by the direction of the current and the magnetic field. And we use our right hand instead of our left hand to know which side of the plane the force points away from. Let's see if you understood that. Here's an IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Okay, using my version of the hand rule, I can have my palm pointing in the direction of the magnetic field and my fingers pointing in the direction of the current. If I do that with my right hand, then my thumb points into the page. So my plane is this plane here, the plane of the page. And the force is into the page. So it's answer B here, into the plane of the paper. Let's try a couple of quick numerical problems using our formula. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. And the first thing you want to notice here is that word perpendicular. The current and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another. So we can write that F equals I L B perpendicular, but it's all perpendicular. So we're going to take the whole magnetic field. Our current was 30 amperes. 
the length of wire was 100 meters and the field, field of the earth, 0.5 times 10 to the minus 5 teslas. Multiply that out, small force, just 0 0.015 newtons. And note here, when you're using that formula, you're often asked for the force per unit length, which of course would just equal the current times the B field. And it would have units of newtons per meter. Here's the second example. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So we're looking for the force on the wire given by I, L, B, sine theta. So it's only the component of B in the direction of the current that contributes a force. So if we draw a magnetic field vector, it would only be this component that would contribute to any force. And that's the component opposite the angle. And that's why we get the sine theta. So let's plug in our values. We've got 30 amps for the current. Our length is 12 centimeters. Make sure you use SI units, 0.12 meters. Magnetic field, 0 0.90 teslas, and it's the sine of 60 degrees. Work that out, you should get 2.8 newtons as the size of the magnetic force. Another IB question, pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Notice first of all here that the angle that they've given us isn't quite what we're used to. The angle that we really want is the angle between the current and the B field. So it's really this angle here. But you can see these are opposite angles. They're the same angle. So when we write force is equal to I L B sine theta, it's the same angle theta that we're used to. Now we're going to be asked for the magnetic field strength, so let's rearrange that. B will be equal to the force divided by I L sine theta. And then we want to notice here that in our equation we've got force over length and the force per unit length is what they're calling P. And that means B, the magnetic field strength, will be equal to this P divided by I sine theta. Correct answer is C. What I want to look at now is the force between two current carrying wires. And though it's not officially part of the IB syllabus, we have all the tools to reason it out. And I think this reasoning certainly could be part of an IB question. So let's start by imagining a single wire with a current going up the page. We'll say it's wire one, so it's got a current I1. And we'd use our right hand rule to tell us the direction of the magnetic field lines around, circling around that wire. So if we pick a point in the page here, say over here, then the magnetic field would be going into the page at that point. I'm going to call that B1. So that's the magnetic field at a distance D from the current carrying wire. And we know how big B1 will be because B1 has to be equal to mu0 I1 divided by that distance D. So what we're going to do now is create a second wire. And we're going to have that second wire be placed at a distance d away from the first wire. So here's our second wire. We'll give it a length here of L, and we'll give it a current here of I2. So that second wire is now in a magnetic field, and it's perpendicular to that magnetic field. So we can talk about the force on that wire 2. It's going to equal the current in the wire, that's I2, times the length of the wire, that's L, times the magnetic field that it finds itself in, and that's going to be B1. It finds itself in that magnetic field B1. And of course the sine theta will be equal to 1 because we have a 90 degree angle between I and B. So now let's substitute B1 into this expression. If we do that, we're going to get I2. I'm going to divide both sides by the length here. So that'll be the force per unit length acting on wire 2. It's going to equal I2 times this B1, which is mu0 I1 all over D. Or rearranging that, mu0 I1 I2 
all over d. So there's the force per unit length acting on wire 2. And of course by Newton's third law there would be an equal and opposite force on wire 1 from wire 2. In terms of the direction of that force we need to use our hand rule. So I'll point my fingers in the direction of I2. My palm is going to have to be facing into the board with the magnetic field and that will mean for my right hand my thumb points to the left. In other words we're going to get an attractive force. So if the two currents are in the same direction we get an attractive force. If the two currents are in opposite directions we'd get a repulsive force and the wires would push away from one another. Now you might have noticed in a list of the seven fundamental SI quantities that electric current and the ampere appears there. And that might have surprised you because you would think that a coulomb would be more fundamental than an ampere. That charge is more fundamental than the rate of charge flow. But these fundamental units are really more based on what can be measured the most precisely. And as it turns out you can measure amperes more precisely than coulombs. Why is that? Well it's really because of the force between current carrying wires. We can measure the force between current carrying wires very very accurately and then use that to define the ampere. So the force between current carrying wires is used to define the ampere. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.